You know, it was quiet in here just about three minutes ago. Everybody rolled in right as we're getting ready to start here. So uh, we will go ahead and begin here shortly. I want to welcome everybody. Glad we could have you here today. Uh, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Dear God, thank you for the cool morning, oh God, and thank you for this opportunity to come into this place together to worship your name and to hear from your word. Dear God, I ask that you guide us as we do this this morning and that uh, you once again transform us by renewing our minds. I ask in Jesus' great name, amen. All right, if our musicians would come as we begin in worship. To our announcements this morning, just a few things to share. Uh, first of all, we have more meat available. Uh, you can talk to me about that. Uh, it's over in the freezer in the fellowship hall. You are free to go and take it without talking to anybody. But once again, the, the big uh, stipulation on that is if we run out, make sure that you inform me uh, or inform uh, Wayne Barber Brooks so that we don't try to send anyone in there to an empty freezer. Uh, next up, 
Iron Sharpens Iron is this Saturday. Now I have some good news and bad news uh, based on how you want to receive it. And, and it's both the same piece of news. So we are meeting at the church at 5.15 a.m. this Saturday for all the men who are going. And we will be leaving the church at 5.30 a.m. So uh, if you are not an early bird, I'm sorry. Uh, but we got to get going so that we can get the worms. So, uh, okay, that wasn't funny. Okay. <laughs> Either that or it's just too early in the morning. I think probably both. Sorry, I'm still on uh, waking up in the middle of the night with baby time here. So uh, we are meeting 5.15 a.m. We will be back in the evening heading on over to O'Fallon, Illinois for this wonderful, wonderful conference. Uh, so one more time, 5.15 a.m. meeting right here at the church, 5.30 a.m. We are heading out towards O'Fallon. Uh, next up, Children's Church returns next week. That'll be during our late service. We have Children's Church there. Also next week, if you go to the next slide, Jump Start is coming back. That is our middle school age youth group. Uh, from 5.30 to 7 p.m. upstairs here in the sanctuary side. Uh, also, I don't have a slide for it, but our high school youth group is going to be resuming uh, September 12th as well. That one will start at 6 p.m. Uh, next up, the annual fish fry. This is also coming up a week from Saturday, September 18th. As, as uh, we always do, we need pies, pies, pies. And in case you haven't heard about this or don't know that much about it, this is a huge community event that we have on an annual basis where we come in and you get a ton of fish and delicious side dishes. We have a country store where you can buy all sorts of wonderful things. We have a silent auction. We have a live auction. It is this huge ordeal every year and all of the money that we get from it gets donated to missions. Uh, uh, goes to a lot of our foreign missions there. So it's specifically we've We've uh, donated a lot to the country of Haiti, um, to missionaries there, to uh, different organizations there and all sorts of stuff. So if you have, if you want any more information on that, there are a lot of people you can talk to about it. Uh, Sharon Frazee would be the first one I'd go to. Talk to Marla Arrowwood. You can talk to just about anybody who's been here for more than a few years because this is, this is probably one of the biggest events we have at this church on an annual basis. So I can tell you all sorts of stuff about it. Uh, I believe that's all the announcement slides that I have. So with that being said, let's stand up and let's greet one another.
All right, good morning once again. Uh, let's head into our theme time. So uh, we as a church have been talking about being Bible-based, discipleship-driven, and mission-minded. And specifically, as we enter a new month, we have a new theme. But this, the verse for this one's a little bit longer. So we're going to read a little bit of this. It says, Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet, and he sprang up and began walking. So to pause there briefly, Paul sees this man who can't walk, and, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, heals him. But let's see what happens after it. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And then our last verse here, and the priest of Zeus whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. Now, this is, a, this is a strange verse to be our theme verse, but it's important. Those we are trying to reach at times will misinterpret what we are trying to share with them. Paul had gone there to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and because they were pagans and they were used to being pagans, they received them as a pagan when they said, oh, you must be Zeus and you must be Hermes. They completely miss the picture. And unfortunately, that's going to be the case at times. When you go to uh, spread the gospel, people are going to take it in all sorts of different ways. Be consistent with the message, and eventually, eventually, the goal is that they will see the truth. All right? So let's head into our prayer time now. Does anyone have any praises they'd like to share? I'll give you a baby update. Uh, Hezekiah is doing very well. He is strong. He is getting loud and... Uh, getting a little bit stinky, and uh, he's just been an absolute blast to have around him. We're hoping, hoping and praying that next week at this time, he will be in here with us. So that's the hope. He'll be six weeks old. Uh, Kelsey is doing very well. We had a very, very good week, and lo and behold, her maternity leave is already almost over. So uh, absolutely fantastic week for us as far as that goes. Any, any praise anybody like to share? Yes. Yeah, uh, that was another, we, we can share in that praise because uh, this was, okay, any grandparents here, if you want to spend time with your grandkids, here's, here's the best way to ask. Lee messaged us one day and said, can I come over and clean your house? <laughs> We're not going to say no to that. And she got to hang out all day and hold the baby and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, keep that, keep that in mind. It's tactics there. Uh, anyone else? Any praises to share? Yes. Amen. Well, good. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I remember feeling so exhausted after those first weeks as a teacher. I do not miss those days, but I do miss the kids like that. So yeah, wonderful. Anyone else? All right, how about any prayer requests? I'll, I'll share one in case you guys didn't know. Marge Henry, who uh, they, her, she and her family, she and Harold, been, you know, attending faithfully for years and years and years. She passed away uh, late this week. Um, so please keep Harold and Jill and, and all the other family members there in your prayers. Um, are there any other prayer requests? Yes. All right, yeah, so keep Brendan in your prayers. Yeah, those ACL tears are no fun. Um, and is this his senior year? Because uh, that makes it even less fun, uh, having to deal with that on, you know, what's supposed to be your big highlight year of, of high school there. So keep him in your prayers there. Keep his family in your prayers. Anyone else? My mom has another bout this week. All right, yeah, yeah. Yes. Anyone else? Yes. What about his mother's effort with cancer? Um, it's all working right. I mean, she's been out of prayer for the last year. 
right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to this place once again, first of all, with thanksgiving. Uh, dear God, that we even have the privilege and the opportunity and, and the right to, to come here. Dear God, I thank you for the blood of your son because that's what has opened the doorway for us to have true fellowship with you. That when you look at us, you don't see our sin, but you see your son. And dear God, we can't praise you enough for that. And so, dear God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that you've poured out to us and through us. And dear God, we come to you also in our time of need with the needs that are presented and the needs even that weren't. And dear God, we ask that you meet those needs in a way that only you can. Dear God, you are mighty to save, you are mighty to heal. And so, dear God, these who are sick and afflicted, I ask that you be with them and that you deliver them from their sickness, that you give them a good recovery. Those who have just lost loved ones, I ask that you comfort them in their time of mourning. And dear God, through all of these situations, I ask that in some way, somehow, you bring glory to your name. Dear God, likewise, I ask that you do that in our church service this morning, O oh God, that you bring glory to your name with all that we say and do. And I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, for musicians would come as we continue in worship.
And so there were a few different directions I was considering going in as after finishing that, but the one that stood out far above the rest was the first letter of John. Uh, John wrote three letters that are included here in our New Testament, and they're full of wonderful lessons for us. Uh, these letters offer, as much as anything else, an expansion of many of the doctrines and themes found in his gospel. So within them, what we're going to see is that John can say a lot without saying a lot, which I am going to hope to emulate for you this morning as I preach it to you. So, uh, if you'll turn to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, and you might be flipping around a little bit today. I'll have uh, as much of it as I can on the screens for you, but let's go ahead and pray as you're turning there. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for the time of worship we've already had, and I thank you, Lord, for your word. And I simply ask that you open up your word to us, that we might understand it, and that understanding it, we might apply it to our lives, oh God. I ask this in the great and holy name of Jesus. Amen. So verse 1 starts out by saying this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. Now, before we really dive into exactly everything that he's saying here, it's, it's important to draw out these parallels. So he says, that which was from the beginning. Well, if I can remind you how John 1-1 started, it said, in the beginning 
was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So once again, it's a parallel of that which was from the beginning, but then he adds on to it, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands. So he throws in a couple other things along with this in the beginning idea. He says, which we have heard. Keep in mind, John was a firsthand hearer of the teachings of Jesus. That which we have seen and with our eyes and we looked upon. John was a firsthand witness to the miracles and other works of Jesus. He saw Jesus glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration. You guys read that story, but that story in itself doesn't do the events any sort of justice. Okay, If you'll remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on a mountain with him, and all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord surrounded them, and it was completely overwhelming. And then Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus, and they got to see Jesus for who he really is. And he saw that firsthand. Not only that, he watched Jesus die on the cross, so he knew that he had actually died, and he saw him again multiple times after he had risen from the dead. But not just that we have heard and seen, but that we have touched with our hands. One of the last stories, uh, Jesus invites Thomas to touch the, where, where he was pierced in his side, to feel the scars in his wrists there, in his hands. John was able to touch and eat, not just that, he was able, well, he didn't eat that, obviously. He was able to eat the bread and fish that Jesus had multiplied. He was able to interact with Lazarus after Lazarus had come out of the tomb. Okay, I say all of that to say this. This is not the account of some scientist, theologian, pastor, professor, or historian from 2021 trying to recount something that happened two thousand, over 2,000 years ago. This is not the account of a guy who heard from a guy who heard from another guy. Okay, I devote myself to studying these things and trying to learn about all of these things that God has taught and that God has revealed to us. But John was a primary source that this was given to. He was actually there for all of these events. You know, one of the amazing things about some modern theologians is they try to say that Jesus did not say A, B, or C. We, they try to say, oh, Jesus didn't really do all of those things. But once again, we're 2,000 years removed from this. If I were to try to tell you anything about Jesus that doesn't come from here, all I'm doing is speculating at best. And that speculation would likely be very unreliable. Okay, this is a firsthand account from a guy who was legitimately there and saw it for himself. Keep that in mind. That, that should give extra weight to his words. You know, if I were to tell you about uh, something that happened at the fair last night. I would not be a very uh, reliable source because I was not there. Kelsey and I took a nice trip to Quincy, Illinois, a nice little two-hour drive to see where she had lived and worked for a year. We just went for a nice little road trip, and it was great. So like I said, if I were to try to tell you what happened at the fair last night, you wouldn't want to listen to me. If you were there, you'd probably be a little bit more reliable. But I remember uh, we, we didn't have the World's Fair, you know, right here in Mocaine, Missouri, one of these big worldwide events. But we had a Labor Day picnic back where I was from. And likewise, in Farmington, they had something called Country Day, a big event. And I remember being in high school, and what always happens at these events in high school is, did you hear about the fight? <laughs> yeah, this guy didn't like that guy, and you know. And you'll find that stories about those fights usually end up exaggerated and overly dramatic, and, and usually they're told by people who didn't actually see it. They said, well, I heard from this person, or from that person, that this time. It's, it's all just diluted and, and not very reliable information. Whereas I bet you the people who are right there witnessing and observing would have a more reliable account of exactly what happened. That's what we're getting from John the Apostle here. Okay, He is a guy who was there firsthand, who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus, who leaned on Jesus at times. And it's an account concerning the word of life. This once again harkens back to the gospel. John frequently described Jesus as the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That word that's translated word is the Greek word logos, which means knowledge or wisdom, basically understanding, basically all of knowledge. Everything that is worth knowing is described in Jesus, the Word of life. 
Then verse 2 says, The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Now, uh, this once again harkens to his gospel. In verse 4 he said, In him was life. And the life was the light of men. But then in verse 14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That life was made manifest. The word manifest means to make it apparent, to make it appear, to show up. There's a TV show called Manifest Out Now. Anybody ever seen that show? I haven't watched it. I've heard things about it. I've heard a lot of people like it. But, but a manifest on a plane is supposed to tell you everything that is on that plane. So likewise, that life was made manifest. Jesus came to earth to show us what was in eternal life. What was life? But it was made manifest multiple times here. Because you've got to understand uh, what he's talking about here. Made manifest means this life was made to appear before them. It was made manifest first. It appeared first in the incarnation of Jesus. If you'll remember when Jesus was born, he was born in a feeding trough because there was no room in the inn, and people came to see him. People that God had said, this is my son. This is the Savior. Wise men who were not even from Israel traveled across the land to come and see him. Shepherds who were out in the field came to see him. But not just that. When they took Jesus into the temple to dedicate him, to circumcise him, at eight days of age, there were two people there who said, one, one was an elderly man who, who basically, he had waited his entire life for the reconciliation of Israel. And God promised that he would see the Savior before he died. And as soon as he saw Jesus, he held him in the pub and basically said, you can let your servant rest in peace. Another was a woman who had, who had been a widow for over 80 years, who spent night and day in the temple. And then as soon as she saw him, she testified about who this was, that this was the Savior of Israel. He was made manifest that way, but he was made manifest in a couple of other ways. He was made manifest, secondly, in his resurrection. When Jesus rose from the dead, he showed that life can indeed conquer death. We have an understanding of life that I am going to live until I die. Jesus lived until he died and then he lived again. He made manifest life that was eternal, life that was not just temporary. But even third so here, John was a witness not only of what Jesus had done with this life, but John was also a recipient of this life. It appeared third in the Holy Spirit, baptism of the believers. Notice the word made manifest is even used, that, that phrase is used twice in here. The first time, the life was made manifest, but the last time it says, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. So it's a little bit different. The first time, by itself, it was made manifest just in general. Jesus, when he was alive, basically everyone could see him. But Jesus' resurrection and the Holy Spirit coming upon the believers was, was much more of a personal event. It was made manifest to us. Okay, we're still in our introduction here. Verse 3 then says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. With this verse, John starts to give us his purpose for why he's writing this. The first-hand observers of Jesus were dying off at this point. John was an elderly man at the time of this writing. The other apostles had all died away, and he was, he was getting close to that point. And so he wanted to make sure that he was able to write down everything that he could to share with us, because there would soon be no one on this earth who was actually a first-hand witness of what Jesus had done. So that which we've seen and heard, he wants to proclaim. Why? So that we may have fellowship with the us there would be the apostles. The us there would be the disciples. But not just them. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John wanted to proclaim to his original audience and also by virtue of time to us who Jesus actually was, what he came to do, and what he taught. And he wanted to proclaim these things so that we could have fellowship with fellow believers, with God the Father, and with Jesus. So this is very certainly a relevant goal for us today, that we might first of all know God, 
If you can know God, the, the book of Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. If you can know God, that's the primary thing to get right. You know, Kelsey and I have just stepped into parenthood, as I've talked about plenty of times already, and there are a bajillion different things that you need to know how to do for your child at some point in their life, right? And not all of them are you going to get right the first time. I have already led to multiple people in my family, multiple people in Kelsey's family, getting uh, uh, urinated on because I did not put the diaper on 100% tightly enough. Okay, there are certain skills that you have to develop, but as a parent, what is the most important thing? That you love your child. If you love your child, you're going to learn how to figure everything else out. If you know your child, you're going to learn how to properly care for them. The biggest goal is to get to know them and to develop that love for them so that whatever need they have that comes up, you are there to help try and meet it. You're not going to be perfect at all of that stuff. You're not going to be perfect at every single task that you try. But if you get the big thing right, if you love your child... Everything else is going to find a way to work itself out. It's going to be okay. Likewise, if we can know God, everything else starts to work itself out. The Bible's overwhelming, amen? 66 books in here, written over a couple thousand years, written over a couple thousand years ago. It's challenging to understand. You don't have to understand every single passage in the scripture to start to know God and love God. You don't need to understand very much of any of it to start out. All you need to do is, I want to know you and I want to love you, and then he will start to give you understanding. But not just God the Father, because without Jesus, we couldn't have fellowship with God the Father. The more you understand about the Bible, you know, the more you know that that's true. Saving grace tells me that I'm freed from hell, but, but sanctifying grace, which, which we talked about last week, shows me that I deserved hell in the first place. You know, most people don't realize the depths of their sin while they're in it. Okay, I, I was a sinner my entire life, but I didn't think of myself as a sinner. I thought I was just, you know, an everyday guy. I was fine. I, I did a few bad things, but for the most part, I was a good guy, I thought. But the longer I've walked with the Lord, the more I have seen just how sinful I actually was and just how much sin I still have to deal with. But God doesn't bring those things down on me like a ton of bricks just to hurt me or to break me down. It's to show me that, hey, guess what? You can be free from this area, too. You don't have to be held by this. Oh, you, you're overly competitive? Okay, I can start to take that away. Where you don't have to win at everything. Where you don't have to try to dominate or, or destroy your opponents or anything. Where you can be kind. I tried to do those things on my own. It didn't work. But when I found that through Jesus there was deliverance from those things, it, it made me excited about discovering areas of sin in my life. Does that sound weird to you? I've become excited about discovering areas of sin in my life. Because here, here, think about this, okay? Anyone ever have something in your teeth? And that thing could have been in your teeth for hours, and you don't realize until you get home, and you look in the mirror, and you see that thing in your teeth, and you're like, oh no, how many people saw this thing in my teeth and never said anything about it? Sin is often just like that. Sin is going to affect every single person that you come into contact with. Whether you want it to or not, it might not always be giant great effects, but it's going to have an effect on people. So used to, when I was confronted with sin, it was, oh no, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to look at that because it's bad. But now it's, I want to be a blessing to others and I know the sin is in the way. And so the, the better you deal with this, God, the more you get rid of this, the more of a blessing I'm going to be to everyone I come into contact with. I get excited when God reveals areas of sin in me that need to go. So we have fellowship with God the Father. We have fellowship with Jesus the Son, who is our deliverance, who is our salvation. He's the propitiation of our sins. And that, by virtue, gives us fellowship with all other believers. There's something unique about meeting fellow believers in Jesus Christ. When you start to talk to them and you realize you're of the same mind, it can be like you've known each other your whole lives, even if you've only known each other for a few hours. Okay, I've had this happen on a number of occasions, and it's, it's beautiful every single time that it does, but this is the goal of John the Apostle's writing of this letter right here is that we might have fellowship with God the Father, with Jesus the Son, and with all other believers. And to make sure that the Holy Spirit's not left out of that, the Holy Spirit is the reason that we have fellowship with other believers. And we need to keep in mind the relevance of this and the importance of this because church, we're in a day and age that Christians are more divided than we've ever seemingly been. 
Okay, as we drove throughout, like I said, we took a road trip to Quincy. We got to Quincy and we noticed just how many churches there were. Guys, if you were to drive through Fulton, you would see a lot of churches. If you were to go to any of the towns around here, uh, I have a friend who used to make a joke that there are more churches than there are people. Okay, there are a ton of churches around, and, and it's necessary to have a lot of churches. We couldn't fit all of the Christians of Callaway County right here into this building. But the problem is, a lot of times, churches feel like we're competing with one another. God forbid we compete with any other church. If that's what we're trying to do, we're in trouble. Okay, if, if it is a true church of the Lord, the goal is we're working towards the same goal, so the idea should be that we complete one another. Oh, hey, you guys can't meet that need in this area? Well, we'll help with that. Oh, you guys need help with that? Great. Oh, hey, we need help with this. You guys come help us with this. We're all working towards the same goal. The goal of fellowship with God the Father, with Jesus the Son, the mission of Jesus Christ and his gospel. And then he continues on, verse 4, And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. His purpose was also to complete joy. What is joy? What's the difference between joy and happiness? Happiness is often circumstantial. Happiness is based on what is going on. Uh, happiness, in some ways, we could say is a feeling. Happiness is a very good thing to have, but happiness in itself is fleeting. Right? Okay, you can, you know, I can go and eat an ice cream cone, and I feel really happy for about 30 minutes after I eat that ice cream cone. You know, yesterday, as I said, we went to Quincy. Uh, I got very hungry, and I had just so happened to buy my wife a candy bar, a giant Charleston chew, which is her favorite candy. It's not my favorite candy, but when you're really hungry, just about any candy is your favorite candy. And I ate that entire Charleston chew on our walk. And it felt great for about 10 minutes. And then the walk started to become painful because all that was on my stomach was some delicious uh, chocolate and marshmallow and all of that good stuff. Okay? It, happiness can be fleeting, but joy is not fleeting. Joy is not an emotion. Joy is more of an attitude. You could call it optimism, but optimism doesn't quite work. You can call it happiness, but happiness doesn't quite work. It is something greater than all of those things. It's above all of those. It's something that's not based on what's going on in your life, but based on whose you are. Because I belong to Jesus, I have joy. We are writing these things that our joy may be complete. But you know, some manuscripts actually said so that your joy may be complete. Either of these could actually work, and the verse would still be accurate for a couple reasons. For there's no greater joy for a minister, someone in my position, than to see someone finally get it, to see something click. You know, uh, at times when you preach, you don't get a lot of feedback. And so you're like, I don't know if they're hearing or not. When I was a teacher, it was the same way. When you're lecturing your class, you don't always know whether or not it's making sense to people. And oftentimes people are polite and they're kind, at least in the pulpit here, and they don't interrupt you and say, uh, Pastor Cody, you're not making sense. In the classroom, it's a little bit different. Okay, if you start to not make sense to them, you'll have a kid say, uh, what are you saying, Mr. Brown? Okay, it happens all the time. But, but when I can see, finally, someone get it, someone truly, I guess, buy in, to see them get saved, to see their lives start to change, to see holiness come out, to see joy start to appear in someone's life, it gives me no greater joy than that. But likewise, there's no greater joy that we can receive, but to have all of those things happen to us. When things start to click, when we get saved, when we have our lives changed for the better. So John is writing that your joy may be complete, that our joy may be complete, or finished, or perfected. And then we get to our last verse for the day. I know, it's surprising you. Last verse already. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. This is going to be a, a key concept that we're going to focus on today, and it's going to help guide us throughout our study of 1 John. Uh, but we need to look back at a couple of other parallel passages to this. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. In God, John's gospel, he said, in him, being Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Very simply, light always wins over darkness. Darkness does not come and chase out light. Light comes and chase out darkness. But really, let's ask a couple of even more basic questions. What is light? 
What does light do? To answer this, let's go even farther back. Genesis chapter 1, verses 2 through 4 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Light was the first thing that God created after the heavens and the earth. The third thing overall. He created the heavens, he created the earth, and he created light. Why did God create light before so many other things? Well, we know, you know, based on science or whatever, that light is a necessary element for producing and sustaining life. You know, we know that it's not just the light, but the heat that comes from the sun that helps to provide nutrients for us. You know, we get vitamin D directly from the sun. Helps provide nutrients for the plants, which provide food for the animals, which provide food for us. Or you can eat plants too, if if you so choose to do that. Uh, We know that light is a necessary part of the production and sustaining of life, but something even more practical is that light reveals things. Light reveals things to us, whereas darkness conceals things from us. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If you'll remember, Satan tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden by convincing her that God was the one trying to conceal things from her and he was the one trying to reveal things to her. Okay, think about this with me. This is our important concept of the day. Satan's lie was rooted in a kernel of truth, as as all of his lies are, because God was trying to conceal something from Adam and Eve. He was trying to conceal sin, evil, wickedness, and ultimately death. You know, likewise, as parents, Kelsey and I are going to do our best to protect our son from all of the evils that the world have to offer. We want him to maintain his innocence for as long as we can. Likewise, God wanted that for humanity. He knew, obviously, of sin. He knew, obviously, of evil because Satan had already fallen from heaven. But Adam and Eve were oblivious to that. And Satan said to them, hey, when you eat of this this tree, when you eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. You'll know good and evil. Well, that was true. They would be like God in knowing good and evil. But in knowing evil and experiencing evil, all of a sudden they started to be compelled towards evil. Satan convinced Adam and Eve that he was the revealer and that God was the one trying to keep something from them. And it happens just the same today. Christianity can be unpopular in our modern culture because, oh, God wants to keep you from having fun. God's just trying to withhold something from you. People think Christianity is restricted. Anyone ever... Anyone ever think that way or been told that? That, oh, I don't want to be a Christian because you can't have any fun. I promise you, the good, good that the world has to offer is far from good. The good the world has to offer is a trap of wickedness. Sexual immorality is incredibly popular in the world, and and people in the world think, oh, there's basically no harm in this. But sexual immorality is destructive. It is 100% destructive. Drunkenness, which is also very popular in the world, drunkenness is destructive. Greed is destructive. And God only wants good for you. So so people often think that God wants to withhold something good, but the problem is the things people are calling good are actually evil and they're hurtful. Now, I'm not trying to tell you exactly how to live your life. I'm trying to tell you the compass by which you can make those decisions for yourself. Okay, because you have freedom to do any number of things. As Paul would say, everything is permissible, basically, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is helpful. An important concept to understand is that God is indeed light. That God is the source of all good things, and there is no darkness in him. 
God only wants good for you, so if he is withholding something from you that appears to be good, you must understand that he's doing so because he has something better for you. Rarely does it feel that way in the moment, but every single time that this has happened to me, when I've gone through the trial and come out the other side, I always end up agreeing with God that what he had planned was better than what I had planned. I've made a large number of plans for my life throughout my life. And what's, what's the common saying? When man makes plans, God does what? Laughs. Because the thing is, we think we have a good idea or a good plan for ourselves. And sometimes they're not even bad or sinful things. You know, we have good ideas, and sometimes God says no to our good ideas, and we say, well, how dare you, God? This is a good idea. But God's good is always so much better than anything we could have planned for us, because God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Understand this today. If you will simply accept this fact that God is good, and whatever he has is better than whatever I think, then you will be on the road to many wonderful blessings in Christ Jesus. If you make this one of the pillars of your faith to say that God is indeed good, and let that be beneath, as far as foundational, but beneath every single circumstance that comes up. You know, I, I sort of alluded to it, and I won't tell the whole story because there's just too much to tell, but... Becoming parents, these first few weeks of our son's life have been incredibly challenging. And they could make us challenge the idea that God is good. We've had a lot of trials that we face. But, but beneath all of that, at the foundation, I have maintained that, God, I know that you are good. And though what we are going through is painful, I know that good is going to come out of this. And that's made all of the difference through the sufferings. It's made all the difference through the trials. Because in the midst of the trials, we had hope. We had joy. We were able to get peace. And we just had to show the not as fun one, patience. I want to continue on in this text, but I'm not going to do that for sake of time. Because I want to be able to give the next few verses as much time as we're able to give these few verses here. But understand today that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. God does not want to withhold anything good from you. He wants to change your perspective of what is good. But but we can't leave without reading these last verses of this chapter. We'll cover these next week. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We're going to cover these things next week, but I just wanted to, to put those into your brain to chew on for now. Join me in a word of prayer as we close here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for, for just the providence of giving us these firsthand accounts from John. Dear God, this man who was able to literally walk with Jesus, who was able to see and believe and share these things with us. We thank you for him, but we thank you also for our opportunity. For you said, blessed are those who have not seen you and yet believe. Dear God, we long to see you one day. I look forward to your return. But dear God, in the meantime, I want to live my life in a way that's pleasing to you. And I believe that's the desire of this congregation as well. So, dear God, I ask that you guide us towards that goal, that you help us to see what is truly good, that you transform our consciences, that they might align with yours, O oh God, that, that we might see good as you see good, and that we might see evil where you see evil, dear God. Let us not twist these concepts to call things that are wicked good and things that are good wicked, O oh God, as our world so often seems to do, but, but give us this clear focus that can only be found through I ask in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. As our musicians come as we prepare for communion, uh, I just need to remind you of a couple things. First of all, the, the uh, logistics. If you did not grab communion supplies on your way in uh, following prayer, I ask that you just raise your hand and I'll come and uh, serve you that. But then secondly, the, the much greater issue here. Jesus Christ came for salvation. 
He came to transform us, and in doing that, to give us light that we might see. But unfortunately, if you'll remember from our study of the Gospel of John, even the apostles didn't quite see it until after Jesus died and rose again. His death is represented for us in these elements that we're going to take. When you take of these things, you do this in remembrance of him so that you remember how serious of a matter your salvation is. We come to church and we're able to have fun and fellowship together and it's good that we do so, but we need to remember what it cost for us to be able to do this. And it cost the blood of the only begotten son of God. Keep these things in mind as we prepare to take. Dear God, please bless uh, these, these emblems that we're about to take as we remember the death of your son. Let us not take of them in an unworthy manner, but let us uh, consider ourselves here and where we are and, and help us to give it the gravity that it deserves, oh God, that we might value good and godly things. I ask this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Waking up to a new Sunrise, looking back from the other side, I can see now with open eyes, darkest water and deepest shame, I wouldn't trade it for anything, cause my brokenness brought As we uh, prepare to depart from this place, I won't read all of the verses from our theme, but I just want to remind you that as you are trying to share your faith, don't expect that everyone's going to, it's going to make sense to everyone right away. And don't think that you failed if that is the case. All right. God will change you through your efforts. He will change the other people, but it might, change isn't always linear. Growth is, doesn't always happen in a straight line. It's often a really curvy road to get there. So simply be faithful to him and let God handle the results. 
Dear God, please be with this people as they go. I ask that you bless them, O oh God, and that you continue to transform each and every one of us by renewing our minds in Christ, that we might uh, bring glory to your name. I ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Have a blessed week.